Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming what I know will come as a bright, refreshing, and thought-provoking look at America and its future as we hear from the Honorable Dr. Ron Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is indeed a real pleasure to be here today. Mr. Johnson, it's a delight to meet you. It's a delight to be at the Detroit Economic Club. It's a delight to see such a nice head table, and I feel very honored. I'm here today to talk uh, about economics and what I think are some of the problems that we face as a nation and what we face in our political system. And uh, I don't see good things ahead. I think we are having a lot of problems. I'd like to explain why I think that's the case. I've been doing a lot of campaigning across the country. My nomination occurred last September, as was mentioned in the introduction. It came a little early because we have to have a name to apply uh, for uh, access to the uh, state ballots. But a lot of the campaigning is done on radios because we can get on a lot of radio talk shows. And not too long ago, I was on a major radio talk show up in Chicago. And it was at nighttime, and it was reaching 20, 30 states. And the call-ins were very good, as usual. Uh, on the radio shows that I've been on for so many months now, I would say 85% are favorable call-ins. People call in and say that uh, I endorse everything you say. I haven't heard it before, but it sounds good. Uh, the system's out of control. Something has to be done, and what you have to say makes a lot of sense. This particular night, I had probably approximately 12 calls, and every one very favorable. Then the next one, I guess because it was number 13, he called in and he said, uh, you know what, he says, I don't, I don't agree with anything you say. And I says, not one single thing. He says, no, everything is fine. His business was doing fine, and he didn't worry about a thing, and he didn't, he didn't see any reason why I should be worried about anything either. And I said, you're not worried about interest rates or deficits, uh, spending, size of government, the Internal Revenue Service, invasion of our privacy, foreign policy. No, he says, everything was fine. And besides, he said he had already decided uh, for whom he was going to vote. He said he had decided to vote for Dukakis and Quayle anyway. <laughs> There's a lot of confusion out there, and, uh, and it doesn't really matter for whom you vote. If you vote Republican and Democrat, you get the same policy, and that certainly is the theme of our campaign. I had worked with Republicans. I thought there would be a difference, but uh, you know the deficits really never change. Just think of what's happened. It took us uh, 204 years to get our first trillion dollar debt. Only well, took four years after that, not with the Democrats in the administration, but with the Republicans in the administration. So there's something seriously wrong. No one individual is to blame, but there's something wrong with the economic and the political system that encourages the accumulation of debt at that rate, and we'll have to face up to it. One of the major problems that we complain about as libertarians is that frequently, those members that go to Washington and their staff people are uh, taught in the uh, universities, which uh, quite often teach the same type of economic policy. And although we campaign a whole lot on camp college campuses and we get good receptions, uh, we're challenged there uh, rather frequently as well. Almost every time if I speak to young people who are then currently taking political science and economic courses, we'll challenge some of the uh, old cliches and they will come back and want to know about antitrust laws and certainly about the horrors of capitalism of the 19th century, many of the things taught in school, and quite frankly, I believe, erroneously. But this one particular time at the University of Pittsburgh, a young man got up and asked the usual question. He said, uh, uh, what about antitrust laws? Don't you have to have government to make sure business doesn't get too big? And you libertarians aren't for antitrust laws. And I said, well, there's good reason for that because uh, all, all monopolies really uh, become monopolies with government protection, and there's no such thing as a free market monopoly. And besides, if a company is big in a free market, <clears throat> it comes about because the company serves the consumer. The consumer becomes king, and as long as a company gets big because the consumer is happy and the consumer votes that confidence by buying those goods, bigness is not necessarily bad. If bigness occurs because of government protections or government contracts or a government uh, uh, protection so that they can have a guaranteed monopoly, that's a different story. And I said, besides, the laws can't be interpreted. He says, what do you mean they can't be interpreted? 
I said, you know, if, uh, if a group of companies uh, uh, are doing business and one company undersells everybody else, they can be accused of undermining the competition. And if somebody spent, charges too much, they say you have too much control and you're gouging the customers. And then if all the, bank, if all the business people are charging the same price, then they say there is collusion. So there's really no way for the businessman to interpret <clears throat> the antitrust laws. This uh, prompted a young man <clears throat> after, the, uh, after the session to come up and he identified himself as a uh, Russian. He had been in this country for approximately 10 years. And he says, your explanation of the antitrust laws <clears throat> reminded him of a joke that went around the Soviet Union when he was still living there. There were three men in prison. And one man said, they started asking each other why, why were they were there. And one person said, well, I kept going to work too early. And it looked like I was trying to get in good with my boss. So they were suspicious, and they put me in jail. And somebody else said, I kept getting to work too late. And they said I was cheating the state, so they put me in prison. And the one other individual said, I kept getting to work on time, and they accused me of owning a Western watch. <laughs> so whether you're in the Soviet Union or the United States, sometimes laws are difficult to interpret. We would like to make it so that there is not a difficulty interpreting law, but we'd like to make it so that we understand what the role of government ought to be. This is what's generally happened in the 20th century, that we as a people have lost our way. We have accepted some ideas about what the government should be doing and what the concept of freedom is all about to the point now where we have carelessly accepted the role of government as being an intervener, one that plans the economy, tells us what we should do with our private lives, and also accepting blindly our role as interferer or intervener in the internal affairs of other nations. We think that's wrong and we should be going in, the wrong, in another direction. The real challenge is big government versus individual liberty. Should the government be there as a planner or should the government be there for the protection of liberty? Well, that answer was clearly defined by the founders of the country. Our founders, our forefathers decided that the British were too expressed too much control on us. And they said, we want less government. There was a declaration of independence, a constitution, a war, and we had guidelines for limited government. Today, those guidelines are no longer looked at. One of the weakest arguments that can be used in the US Congress is a constitutional argument. It isn't interesting to the other members of Congress. Big government versus individual liberty is the, is the question that we must ask. What should the role of government be? Now, there's a reason that government has gotten out of control. It's a political reason it's more than an economic reason. The political reason is that we have allowed ourselves to accept the notion that government is to take care of special interests. So they accept the philosophy of utilitarianism and pragmatism. Therefore, they can do what they want depending on the circumstances. But it is a philosophy. It isn't, uh, it isn't pragmatism in the sense that uh, they are avoiding the extremes of philosophy. They accept an extreme form of government that says government power can be used to serve powerful special interests. And look at the record. Look at the number of lobbyists in Washington. Look at the PAC committees. Do the PAC committees do donate their money to Republicans or Democrats? Powerful PACs always donate to both parties because they want power and control. Look at the way budgeting occurs with pork barreling, the essential way of promoting special interests for everybody's district. What happens to the politician? The politician has pressure put on him to vote a certain way, and he comes to the belief that he cannot be reelected unless he votes a certain way for his district. Voting for freedom for his district? No, voting to see what he can get in a materialistic way. We are a materialistic, obsessed society that says that government is in the business of redistributing wealth. And therefore, the pressure on the congressman is to get things and privileges for special groups. Now, what happens? Is he rewarded? Certainly is. 98.5% of them are reelected, so the people evidently have gone along with this for a good while. But what has it done? Well, the politician knows some of it has to be paid for, so they do apply some taxes to us. But it's getting to be popular to not be for taxes. And that's a good plan. We're certainly not for taxes. But 
the whole thing is, is you raise taxes, they don't have enough taxes, then what do they do? They devise a monetary system that accommodates the politician. If they can't collect enough revenues from us, what they do is they devise a system where they can sell the debt to the Federal Reserve System. Now, where does the Federal Reserve get the money and credit so the Treasury can send out their checks? They get it out of thin air. It's positively amazing. They talk about us as libertarians having extreme ideas, but isn't it rather extreme and bizarre to think a government should run up a $220 billion deficit per year and then print the money to make up the difference? That to me is bizarre and something that we ought to challenge, and that's what we're doing. The money supply is important to us in Austrian economics and libertarianism is because Austrian economics teaches that the business cycle is explainable. It's explainable because it is caused by the Federal, Federal Reserve System. As there's creation of new money and credit, it creates the boom, it creates the high prices, it causes the high interest rates, and then the Fed is required then to cut off the credit and causes the crash. And we've been going through this through violent cycles for the last 70 years or so. And we're certainly on the verge of seeing some ramifications from a huge increase in the money supply especially between 1982 and 1987. A lot of people say you shouldn't worry about inflation. A lot of economists are saying this because they say prices aren't going up so fast. That's exactly what they said in the 1920s. But if you have a tremendous amount of production, it can compensate and keep prices at a lower level than would be predicted by the monetarist theory of economics. That is, if you increase the supply of money 10%, prices go up by 10%. That is not the case. But there are some other bad effects from inflation. The inflation that originates by the Congress interfering by running up the deficit and the Fed creating the uh, new credit. What are the other serious problems that come from the inflation? Well, the, one of the most serious is the accumulation of debt. People can borrow because there's credit in the market and as it spreads through the banking system, there is a high liquidity of credit and so there's over expansion. Certainly there was overexpansion in Texas when the prices were soaring in oil and then there had to be a correction. And that's the way the whole country is operating, through overexpansion and then a correction that must occur. So we have this huge amount of debt that we have accumulated. And this is no small amount. National debt at $2.6 trillion, nearly twice as big, uh, near, twice as much debt accumulation during the Reagan administration as all the other presidents put together. Now those are some serious figures that we have to uh, concern about ourselves about. But the other thing, the two things, the accumulation of debt and the malinvestment. Businessmen doing the wrong things because they get the wrong information from the manipulation of money and credit. Mm -hmm. For that reason, we as libertarians advocate a different monetary system. One where it is not centrally controlled by a monopoly, but one that comes from the marketplace, one that was designed by the founders of this country who had gone through inflation and that said that Congress should be very limited in monetary policy, and that is to the minting of gold and silver coins, but not to the artificial creation of credit out of thin air. Now there are others than libertarians who are concerned about the economy. One Felix Rohayton, uh, a long way from being called a libertarian, had this to say, say about what he thinks uh, something uh, the conditions are like. He says, people still don't realize today that last October 20th, we came within a half an hour of really blowing up the Western economic system. I believe that was the case. That was Tuesday morning when things were uh, rough and tumble still in the marketplace. They do have emergency powers available to take over the banking system in all industries precisely because they know, those who are in charge know that we are on very shaky grounds with our economic and political system. What holds it together? It's confidence. But is it good confidence? Are we putting our head in the sand? Are we, he, are we accepting this because we truly have a sound monetary economic system? This is one thing that Ronald Reagan deserves credit for. He gives us a lot of conf confidence. He makes us feel good about ourselves. But is that good? I mean, what if I have a patient who has appendicitis and I hypnotize them and I make them feel good, then they, they die the next day of a ruptured appendix? I think we have to be willing to look at the hard, cold facts about what's happening and do something about it. And right now, it's out of control. Out of control is spending, inflating, and the, uh, out of the deficits are out of control. Social Security, 
You know, the federal government just recently has spent many, many dollars advertising how sound the system is. How sound is the system? Will the Social Security system truly have more than a trillion dollars by the turn of the century in their coffers? Hardly. What do they hold? Treasury bills. How do you spend a treasury bill? You have to tax somebody to get the money to buy the treasury bill back, or you have to print the money. So it's an all illusion. They tell us the annual deficit's $150 billion a year, but the national debt goes up at the rate of $240 billion a year if you count the off-budget items and the borrowing from the trust funds. I think that's an interesting phenomenon or an interesting word, you know, government trust funds. I think there's something illogical about that. <laughs> if insurance company ran their programs like the government ran the social security system, they'd all be in prison. Maybe we could rebuild our highways if the trust funds would have been left in the highway trust fund because they certainly collected enough revenues, but they were, went, they were taken and spent elsewhere. In 1957, it would have taken 22 years for us as a nation to double our wealth. Today, it would take 175 years. Our productive capacity is down. We do not compete. We do not sell and build most of the cars for the country anymore. And there's something wrong with our productive capacity. During this administration, during the Reagan administration, there were 800 bank failures and there are now 1,600 on the endangered list. Right now, it's estimated that we need $100 billion to finally, if, if even then, to bail out FDIC and the shakiness of our savings and loan industry. Between 1941 and 1970, when we were on a relative gold standard, it certainly wasn't a domestic gold standard, but it was an international gold standard under Bretton Woods. During that period of time, we had a deficit accumulation of $2.5 billion per year. The Bretton Woods Agreement broke down in 1971, and if you look from 1971 up until 1986, we were accumulating national debt at the rate of $95 billion a year, and obviously it's much higher right now. So there's something to be said about what kind of a check the gold standard places on government. Politicians can't spend money if they're not allowed to print it. There's a limit, it's self-limiting. The only thing that is self-limiting now, since they can expand the money supply, is the, some of the economic laws that they have no control over. Some of those laws are that, uh, that there's a limit to how far you can stretch the dollar. If the dollar becomes too weak, and since we are a reserve currency, this causes international uh, crises on, on, the, on the marketplace. But how much more borrowing can we go through? We have now, we now owe $600 billion a year to foreigners. And there's going to be a limit to how much borrowing and certainly, there's going to be a limit to how much more consumption of wealth. We don't have many more Social Security funds to consume the wealth of. And certainly, soon, at the rate we're going, the Japanese and others will own more land here than American citizens at the way we run our policies. We have to seriously consider another option. I thought that during the 1970s, supporting Ronald Reagan would be the proper option. I thought the government would be reduced. I was disappointed, disheartened. I thought the least he could have done was introduce a balanced budget just one time. Last year, during the State of the Union message, he promised, he made the American people promise, he says, if they ever do this again to me, pointing to the continuing resolution, if they ever do this again to me, I'm going to veto it. Three weeks before he leaves office after eight years, he's going to start vetoing continuing resolutions. We need more than that. We need more than just talk. We need some action if these problems are real. If they're not real, fine. We just continue spending. We all maybe continue to spend, and we do. Just look at the consumer borrowing. Look at the debt of corporations. It's huge, and it's unsustainable. It will come to, it will come to an end. The total debt now, uh, percentage of GNP, is much greater now than it was in 1929. Therefore, I think it has bad, it's a, there's a bad omen. In order to protect and uh, uh, for businessmen to protect against the uh, international exchange of, of currency, there's a half a trillion dollars worth of currencies traded every single day, trying to outguess the value of money. If you have an international gold standard, there's no gambling, no risk taking because money is universal and it is one unit. But today we have nothing more than gambling. That's what's going on. Eventually, the trust will be lost, and my prediction is that Ronald Reagan, as great as he was for making us feel good about ourselves, has hidden 
You know the real problems that we face and at the time of this election this year, nearby, maybe before, maybe thereafter, confidence will be gradually lost and there will be a resumption of a financial crisis because we're in the midst of the crisis already. It's not brand new. I'm not saying it's coming. I'm saying that it's already here. And when you hear people like Felix Rohayton mentioning how serious it is, I think we all ought to wake up and the solution is political. The solution is political is that we need more determination in Washington to do a better job to vote for less government. People need to be less materialistic and say the purpose of government is to give me things. The purpose of government is to give and protect and guarantee our liberty. I find 1988 as a very unique and special year. It's unique and special for us as libertarians, but it's unique and special for this country because the majority of the American people today are not Republicans or Democrats. We already won the election. If you include us with those who say none of the above, I've had it. The majority of the people either aren't voting or aren't registered and they don't bother because, not because they're totally apathetic, although I'm sure there are some, they're not doing it because they tell you it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter, but it should matter. We still live in a free country. It's a country that allows me to speak out, to run for president, go to the Congress, and we do have rights. But if we sit and do nothing, then it may become too late. There was a young man in 1930 by the name of Robert Robinson, a black man who was employed here in Detroit. In 1930, he was, he was worried he'd lose his job, and he read the papers, and he read everything that he could, and they said a bad depression was coming, and it was all coming because of capitalism. They blame capitalism on the problems, not on the Federal Reserve System, and not on the uh, expansion and the malinvestment that was occurring in the 1920s. So they, and so he responded logically, what he, to what he thought was logical. He went to the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was said to be a great haven and a great place to go. Within one year, he discovered that he had made a serious mistake, and for 27 consecutive years, he applied to get out of the Soviet Union, never got out. After 44 years, he escaped and moved to Uganda. And last year, during this year, matter of fact, he came to this country and he gave us some advice. He says, you Americans, you take all your freedoms for granted. You cannot know the value of freedom until you lose it. I don't think we should wait until we lose it. Our freedoms are being threatened. Whether it's in the economy or our personal liberties or in our foreign policy, it's being threatened because government gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Why is it that a, 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 a president like Ronald Reagan would hire 220,000 new bureaucrats and look at the speeches that he's made? There's something wrong, it's out of control. The solution is clear. The solution is to redefine the purpose of government. If we do not ask that question and we do not give the proper answer, it doesn't matter what you do. You can vote Dukakis, you can vote Bush, you can stay at home, it won't matter. Because the momentum is so great for getting the expansion of power in Washington. Just look at what they do in the name of the drug laws. Just look at what they do in the name of taking care of the poor. Just look at what they do in the name of spreading democracy around the world. It's totally out of control. That suggests that government ought to be limited for the purpose of guaranteeing liberty. The market ought to be free. We certainly object strenuously to the harassment of the Internal Revenue Service. The founders of this country were very upset about the taxing authorities of the, and the methods of the British. And Yet today, what do we do? We complacently accept the role of slave by keeping all the records, allowing the records to be used to incriminate us. We assume that we're guilty until we prove our innocence to the Internal Revenue Service, and if we don't do that quickly, our property is confiscated without due process of law. We think that should come to an end the sooner the better. Isn't it rather amazing that there's a bill floating around in the Congress, and you might ask Senator Benson next week why he made sure it didn't get onto the agenda and get passed, and that's the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, because he as an individual kept it from coming off to, up on the floor. The Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, a token effort to give the taxpayer protection. It was a bill that I had originally co-sponsored. 
But isn't it sad that we have gotten to the point where we make the assumption that taxpayers aren't citizens? Why aren't taxpayers protected under the, bill, the original Bill of Rights? That's where the problem is. We, we have lost our understanding about what a free society is, and we are determined to live as a materialistic society and claim that government will take care of us in anything and everything that we do. We think it's time, for instance, in foreign policy that Japan and Europe pays for their own national defense. Why should we sacrifice ourselves? You know, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars defending Europe over the last several decades. Ronald Reagan didn't even have flying rights when he decided to go to Libya. It's not even a good investment. It's morally wrong because we don't have any moral authority to involve ourselves in the internal affairs and use our CIA to plan murders and overthrows. Constitutionally, there is no authority for that type of activity. Where is it written in the Constitution that we should devise a central intelligence agent to go and trade weapons with the Ayatollah and terrorists and then fight secret wars? The Constitution doesn't defend it, and militarily it makes no sense whatsoever. There's no military advantage to our foreign policy because it is precisely the policy that encourages the communist movement in so many countries. Think about the Philippines and the Democrats and Republicans support for Marcos, or whether it was for Batista in Cuba, or whether it was for Samosa in, uh, in Nicaragua, or whether it was for the Shah in Iran. The people turn against us and turn toward radical forms of government. So it's more practical to accept the position of the founders of this country saying that the purpose of foreign policy is to defend this country and to be neutral in the affairs of the world rather than pretending that we're the policemen and that we know what's best for everybody else. <laughs> but there is one reason why it'll come to the end. If they won't accept our moral argument, if they don't accept the military argument, if they don't accept the constitutional argument, the American people must accept the, accept the economic argument, we're broke and we can't afford anymore. We can't afford a welfare state that doesn't work it doesn't get the poor people off the street and doesn't teach our kids any better in a public school, which, by the way, is run by a monopoly that I don't approve of. <laughs> the policies don't work, and therefore the economic laws of the limitation of debt will eventually bring it to an end. When it comes to an end and we're in the midst of that, the default is going on, we have to have options. Today, it is very difficult for the Libertarian Party or any other option to get their message out. Since if, if you can come to the agreement that there is no difference between Republicans and Democrats, you don't have a choice. So therefore, we as a nation are one of the most difficult nations to present alternative views to the people. The laws are written so it's difficult to get on the ballots. The funding occurs from the taxpayers to the one other party. It is very difficult. Will the debates occur with us on the debate so that the people have a, uh, have a choice? Not likely. In spite of the obstacles, we are determined. We think the message is powerful. The message is on our side. We're speaking the truth, something the other two candidates have difficulty uh, pursuing, giving straight answers. It's difficult because they don't have the answers because they accept the notion of government that government should be doing all these things. That's why you can't tell the difference between economic policy of Bush or Dukakis. You certainly can't tell now, as the campaign uh, goes on, the difference between their foreign policy as well or their weapons policy because they don't ask the right questions. And that's the reason policies never change. Policies will change if we get the ideas and the questions of the libertarians out because the American people will respond. Thomas Paine said, those who expect to reap the benefits of liberty must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. We as libertarians will use that fatigue in order to support these ideas we so dearly hold. But we are inviting others to join us in our efforts to maintain freedom and prosperity in this country. Thank you very much.